Welcome to Case by Case. This is a podcast brought to you by Callum Chain and Luke Sadkovich from ZFZ. How are you, Callum? We've squeezed in another one this week. It feels a little bit like we are uh, we're, we're we're making sure the fans get what they need from the from the podcast uh, with some with some big efforts, which is uh, which is made all the easier by a very interesting case. I'd say. Yeah, this is a beauty, and and we're we're out of shipping. Uh, we're into arbitration here, um, pretty much pure arbitration law. Uh, and we're in the in the Court of Appeal in England. Um, I'm really excited to get into the case. Before we do, though, I am super excited, even more excited than I usually get for our podcast, Callum. I don't know why. One of our colleagues has returned from Australia with a little gift. Can you see that? Tim Tams. <laughs> Tim Tams. Tim Tams, the world famous Arnott's Tim Tams. This is not a paid commercial, um, but you know they, it's it's a dear dear taste that takes me back to when I was a child growing up in Australia. So very excited, it's a Tim Tams. I think I might reward myself after this recording with one. This isn't a paid commercial, but if the good people at Tim Tams are listening, then uh, we do do product placement for the right types of products. We do, and if you want to just send us a packet of Tim Tams every you know odd month. They'll get eaten, I can assure you of that. Just, just to keep your own dress. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, from Tim Tams to High Court judgment, no, yeah, Court of Appeal judgments, uh, excuse me, um, we've got a decision here of Lord Justice Males, Lord Justice Noogie, and Lady Justice Falk. Uh, this is the case of National Iranian Oil Company and Crescent Petroleum Company, um, and also Crescent Gas Corporation. Those are both, both the Crescent companies are the the respondents defendants. Um, it's an appeal from the commercial court and a decision given by Mr. Justice Butcher. Uh, the um, let me see where is it? I'm missing it on mine. Do you have a citation there? I do. They have it on. Citation is uh, 2023 EWCA Civ 826. Uh, yeah, I was. I see. I've got the. I've got the citation for the court below um relatively recent judgment this only came down a few days ago i see on the 13th of july 2023 um so yeah big decision really really looking forward to it. we've got um a judgment written up by one of our our faves if we can say that about a lord justice with the greatest respect lord justice males uh, has written the the leading judgment here um, and it's unanimous. We've got Lord Justice Noogie and Lady Justice Falk all agreeing or both agreeing with males. Yeah. So where to start on this? This is this is one that's gone back a long, long time, hey? It goes back a while. And I had the same question, where to start? Because there is a feast of procedural law, um, of arbitration law, of interesting facts, of Iranian law. Uh, for those interested in this decision and um it, i was just going through and marking the kind of key points to talk through and normally normally there are a few that i hit and on this case i think i've got about 10 points of interest to to try and cover up i don't think we'll hit all of them but the, this is a this is a richly interesting decision um you know so it, we're talking about we're talking about um yeah, as you say arbitration law the underlying dispute it doesn't really feature too heavily, um, but the principles in this case are relevant across the board and, uh, for anyone who's involved in the world of commercial law, commercial arbitration. It's a really interesting decision on um, a number of points. Really what we're looking at is the question of jurisdiction um, and, and even more narrowly, Section 67 uh, challenges to jurisdiction. Uh, and it's, it's, it's interesting for a number of reasons. One, to unpack um under english law what are some of the procedural challenges that you can bring or, or appeals you can bring um to an arbitration award and i think that's that's interesting because you know we're in section 67 here and we don't see too many section 67 um challenges uh, so that's one interesting point as you say the the way that we interpret arbitration agreements um and what types of claims may fall within them or are outside of them. I think that's an interesting point. And then one of the, the most kind of fascinating aspects of this case and what really grabbed me, and, I, and it's 
it's relevant because it's come up on on other matters for me is the interplay um between having foreign law governing a contract but that contract that dispute being resolved in england or in a different jurisdiction and seeing where the contours or the guidance that the court gets from um from the foreign law and indeed the limits of where that guidance comes from foreign law is really really fascinating and i, and I think i'd put a an, an underline or bold on on that point and it's one that i i know i'm i'm uh, itching to get into as we, as we talk this one through, Callum. The court has has been helpfully forthright in their view of what should and should not be uh, adduced as a matter of of um, foreign foreign law. Yeah, there's a, there's a definite practitioner's point in there, isn't there? Uh, practitioner's guide and so on. What what does a foreign legal expert? Um, what what are they doing when they come to an English court? What's the what, what's really their role? And and I think that's. I, again, it's it's kind of some of the you know it's a runoff of the point that I'm trying to make, but that's something that I think we really should get into because there's really useful tips for other practitioners, for our team, for for other other players in in this space. I agree, and 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 traps to traps to avoid because I think there it will come on to it, and but there are traps there are traps that you could easily fall into on on foreign law, um, wanting to say too much. Um, being the main one, but which which I think you know almost anyone would be would be likely to be guilty of, and this this is a helpful um, reminder of the way that the courts view or the way the court is seeing is seeing the helpfulness or otherwise of um, of foreign law experts. And I think you're right. I think ultimately um, that that didn't help uh, the party that was seeking to rely on the foreign law. I, I think it actually undermined their position. Had they been much narrower. In identifying the differences between English law and um, here Iranian law on um, the canons of construction, on on the principles for interpreting um, an arbitration agreement, then it may have been more persuasive. Should we take it from the top with that? With with that, that, with, with that long intro, um, should we go all the way back to two thousand and one when this contract first came to be? <laughs> yeah, let's let's start there. So. You have a contract between the National Iranian Oil Company um, and Crescent. It was originally uh, Crescent Petroleum Company International Limited. The contract was then assigned to uh, Crescent Gas Corporation. Um, it was for a long-term supply of gas from Iran to the UAE. And um, the, the contract was governed by Iranian law. And provided for arbitration. Um, the it was common ground. That the arbitration agreement itself was governed by Iranian law, um, and there was a dispute under the contract. We don't get a huge amount of detail about what the dispute was. We're simply told that uh, the National Iranian Oil Company did not perform its obligations under the contract, and Crescent commenced arbitration on the fifteenth of July, two thousand and nine, little over fourteen years ago. Um, the the, the case the case rumbled on and there were a series of different awards at different points in time um the the one which is an issue here was it was what's called the, the remedies award and under the remedies award the uh, crescent was awarded a little over one billion dollars in respect of a loss of profits claim a little over a billion dollars in respect of a claim for liability to cngc um, and I'll come up, come back to that, but the arbitrators deferred a further question relating to indemnity. That question is still going on um, a long time after the arbitration started. There must be some very complex issues to unpack there. This this appeal related to to the liability um, to CNGC. So so the role of CNGC in this is um, is that they they were a subsidiary of Crescent. Um, so you have National Iranian Oil Company. Selling, um, selling gas as it was to um, um, oil or gas, I can't, can't recall, um, to Crescent, and then Crescent was on selling it under a kind of downstream contract to this other Crescent entity called CNGC. Crescent had these liabilities to CNGC. The failure of the uh, Iranian oil company under the head contract had caused uh, liability downstream to Crescent to their to their subsidiary entity. 
and the arbitrators in the um, National Iranian Oil Company um, versus Crescent arbitration had found that that liability could be calculated at just over $1 billion. And this was the question um, that, that was under appeal. This, this part of that remedies arbitration award was, was being appealed by the Iranian oil company uh, in this decision. They were effectively saying, or they effectively said at first instance, the tribunal did not have jurisdiction to make that award because they were in effect determining a liability between Crescent and CNGC, and they didn't have uh, they, they they didn't have the jurisdiction to determine that liability. Now this arose under so, so, Iranian so law. Just pull, sorry, just pull yeah. in there for a moment, Hallam. Um, so j just to kind of you know um, summarize that that last bit a little bit in, in that if we think about it as A, B, and C, A and B are in, have entered into this contract. A being the National Iranian Oil Company, B being Crescent, A and B is the main contract that we're looking at in this um, decision. A and B have an arbitration agreement. B being Crescent, then have a contract with CNGC being C. And the question is whether this liability under B, C is something which the arbitrators under A and B can look at. And, and consider and assess its liability. Yeah. Um, and from an English law perspective, that's not a difficult proposition at all. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, that, that's, that's, a, that's a, a hallmark guarantee claim or, you know, many other types of claims where there could be some kind of pass-through liability. Um, so, we're, so we're looking closely now at that, if you like, A and B um, arbitration agreement to see what, falls within that and what doesn't fall within that. And just to be absolutely clear, the, 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 the tribunal here aren't being asked to determine as between B and C what the liability is in that dispute. They're being asked as between A and B, how much should B be awarded in respect of their liability to C? So in the arbitration between A and B, exactly. they're saying how much should, should B be awarded Given that it's like has this liability, this downstream liability. Yeah, um, because of course uh, you, you know it, f this is arbitration one hundred and one. For but there, there could be people listening in that don't know much about arbitration law. Um, arbitrators are appointed by consent, um, either at the at the outset of the contract or um, some post contract agreement to um, resolve a dispute arising between A and B or any other parties that are actually a party to that arbitration agreement. What they are not doing and what they cannot do, they can't act like a court um, and determine liability for parties that are not party to the arbitration agreement. So in this case, C, they can't determine the liability between B and C because C is not a party to the arbitration agreement. So we have we have a first instance decision. And this is this this all plays out as what's called a section sixty seven challenge. So not an appeal it's a challenge, and this is something which is open to a party to do following an arbitration award. They can say the tribunal that gave the award did not have jurisdiction to give uh, to to make the award. They, they 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 did not have jurisdiction to determine the matters that they determined in the award. That's what the national the National Iranian Oil Company said with respect to the part of the liability that was awarded against them. In respect of the losses, the downstream losses, they said that bit was you overstepping your jurisdiction. We're going to challenge the award on that basis. Um, they lost, um, and they then appealed to the court of appeal. Now, this was not just an appeal um, from NA from the National Iranian Oil Company. Crescent actually also cross appealed because there was part of the Section sixty challenge, Section sixty seven challenge that Crescent had argued. That Crescent lost on, and this was the, um, the, the, the this was the uh, part of the award that was um, sorry this the, this was this was the part of the appeal from Crescent where they said that uh, NAOC was unable to um, or uh, the, the, the NAOC, NAOC should be prevented from bringing the challenge at all because under Section seventy three of the Arbitration Act. They'd lost their right to even challenge ar the the arbitration. So you 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 lose your ability to bring a section sixty seven challenge in certain circumstances. And Crescent effectively said, 
those circumstances had arisen, the the judge at first instance said, no, those circumstances have not arisen. Therefore, NAOC can bring this challenge. However, the challenge fails for uh, substantive grounds. Yeah, I, that's an interesting, uh, interesting part of this procedurally is that under Section 73, there's, if you like, an obligation um, to bring whatever objections you may have in the arbitration before the arbitrators and not raise them for the first time before the court and have kind of keep an argument up your sleeve. Uh, and there's some, so there's some useful principles on Section um, 73, which, which we, we can get into. Um, but it's this concept that, well, you can't, you can't hold things back waiting for the challenge. You've got to put them before the arbitrators first. And if you don't raise your objection um, fairly and you know, forwardly, uh, during the arbitration, you could then lose your ability to bring that type of challenge because it also goes into the court's role, the way that it, it approaches the question in a section 67 challenge. It, it looks at the issue uh, from scratch. It, it, it's, a, it's a de novo type uh, analysis where it's not um, bound in any way by what the arbitrators have decided, as the court is not um, bound by what the arbitrators have decided. The arbitrators, if as described here, have a cogent award, it may be of interest and it may be read with interest and it could even be persuasive. But it, formally speaking, it doesn't, um, it, it, it doesn't encourage the court in one direction or the other it's, yeah. uh, and it doesn't have any kind of binding effect. So I think that's, that's part of what's happening here is that the, 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 the court's looking at it completely again afresh. But the flip side of that is that it has to be an issue that was raised um, uh, before the tribunal as well. And there's there's even a um, preliminary question that comes in here, which I found fascinating in the decision, which was under Section 67, there are certain, well, I've seen stepping back one step further, the cross appeal, so the appeal brought by, by Crescent was that these points were not raised um, previously and therefore when the judge uh, and, and therefore the uh, NIOC should not have been entitled to bring a challenge on the grounds that they that they ran the the judge found that that argument failed and the judge did not allow permission to appeal section 67 says that to appeal against the decision of the court you have to have permission to appeal from the the high court itself and so there was this initial question of whether or not um, Crescent could even bring their cross appeal. So, are, were, were Crescent could could Crescent obtain permission to appeal from the Court of Appeal in order to run the argument that they failed on at the High Court? And the argument they failed on at the High Court was that the, the National Iranian Oil Company would not be entitled to appeal on the grounds that they hadn't or already kind of prefaced the or raised or floated the arguments that they. Uh, now sought to rely on um, in the during the arbitration itself. But it's a bit tough, that isn't it? Where where one party gets permission and the other party doesn't get permission. Yeah, <laughs> I, thought, I thought you kind of you you're not. It's not just a, a little bit tough on the parties, but you're also tying the hands of the court of appeal, right? <laughs> right, exactly. And that, and I think we can we can probably skip skip reasonably quickly through this bit because it was it was highly procedural, but. It, it, that, and that, that was that was effectively what the court of appeal said. They said, you know, actually, we can't give you permission to appeal on this. We 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 find that there are some interesting things that we could that were discussed. There were, obviously the argument happened. They, the the way this would have happened procedurally is that they would have had the argument over whether or not there was permission to appeal. Obviously, the court of appeal said, well, we'll deal with this in the judgment. But in the meantime, tell us what you would be saying if, assuming you get permission, give us the arguments. And in this decision, the court of appeal say. Well, actually, we we would not have given you, or we don't give you permission to appeal, um, which is a shame because we heard some really interesting arguments. But because those arguments are because there's no permission to appeal to the court of appeal, it wouldn't be appropriate for us to uh, to to talk about them. Is it section? It's paragraph sixty nine of the judgment. For these reasons, I would hold that this court has no jurisdiction to grant permission to Crescent on the cross appeal. That being so, despite the interesting arguments we heard on the merits of the cross appeal, it would be wrong to say anything further about them. So you just you just wonder whether if the merits went the other way, whether that that would have got an airing. Yeah, 
you, you won the yeah. You know, uh, like they, in a way, they didn't have to because they'd already ruled the other way on on the on the other issue, right? But exactly. If, and, if that was if that was more in play, then yeah, it would be interesting to see if they tried to find a way around that. It would it would have been interesting because it, effectively what was argued was the uh, the Crescent said. Um, so this this is a statutory interpretation exercise because you're looking at section 67 in particular section 67 4 which says that um a it has that if if there is a decision of the court on, in respect of section se section 67 then that can only be appealed with the permission of the court and the court is a reference to the high the high court um and the argument from Crescent was, well, this wasn't a decision. This was a, it was something else because you weren't fully and finally deciding something. You were simply saying um, that uh, NAOC had the right to raise certain arguments. You weren't really making a decision on whether those arguments succeeded. You weren't making an, you weren't, you weren't saying that their appeal was guaranteed to fail because they weren't allowed to raise the arguments. You were just saying, this is, you know, you, 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 it wasn't as difficult to find a way to put it because it, it, it really the court was making a decision and the court of appeal said, yes, the court, the high court was making a decision. But the, the, the line that, um, that the Crescent tried to draw here was that it's not a decision because it's not dispositive of the issue. And if it's not a decision under section 67, then it doesn't fall within section 67 for as being something that the high court needs to give it needs to um, needs to grant leave to appeal for, and the reason for all of this, the kind of legislative reason, the policy reason behind this being the way that it is, um, it all goes back to that concept of what what does arbitration do? What's the point of arbitration? Why do we encourage arbitration between commercial parties? And it's it, it's intended to be cost effective. It's intended to be efficient, um, and it's intended not to have multiple layers of challenge and appeal um and rehashing um decision made you know decisions that have previously been made through the courts um and the court of appeal the court of appeal here they they found that they, well they, they they mentioned that there was no direct um authority on specifically this point but there was some kind of similar authority that they could use to say it well that does constitute a decision the court the high the high court has made a decision here They've, they've not allowed you permission to appeal from that decision and therefore we are not entitled to offer you permission to appeal either yeah and look it's it's a uh, it's it's all really interesting and, and I know quite a procedural point so I'm conscious not to lose lose anyone on, on the on the point um and we'll get on to the the substance uh you know in a moment under section 67 um but there there is a useful section in this judgment on uh, what the first instance court said about section 673 um, and th this is the the decision of Mr Justice Butcher and he went through um, and considered a number of first instance authorities on section 73 um, and I think the most important one of those was the the Rustal trading and Gill case from 2000 um, and there are a series of others as well, and kind of went through these various authorities and then laid out really helpfully the fundamental um, principles to look at when you've got a, a, a Section 73 issue. And this is this question about whether the, um, the, the ground for objection um, was put to the arbitration panel um, uh, sufficiently and not being raised for the first time before the court. And um, really, I think that the crux of it is that it's the substance of each ground of objection that needs to be put um, before the tribunal. And and then there are a number of principles to kind of unpack that. And I, I thought I might just quickly go through those. Yeah. Um, the, there's a fundamental principle or, or policy even of fairness and justice um, and a kind of openness and fair dealing. I know that all seems a bit woolly, but that is the overriding fundamental principle here is that parties you know, should not have these kinds of arguments sprung upon them. Um, there's a concern about uh, wasting time and expense, and that's another reason for this to be raised uh, early in the process. Um, 
the issue as to jurisdiction must normally have been raised at least on some grounds before the arbitrator. So um, it, it, it needs to be put forward as a challenge to jurisdiction. Um, so, it, you know, it needs to be connected in some way to a jurisdiction um, defence. Um, and it, it also needs to be easy. I thought this was interesting. It needs to be easy to recognise or obvious, if you like, um, that the that the party is kind of raising a new ground of objection. I think these things often are. If you're in a in a in a scenario where, well, it, it kind of was there, it was mm. there or thereabouts in, before the tribunal. Um, then it's perhaps not so obvious that it's a new ground in in, in the court uh, uh, when brought under section sixty seven. So th that was an interesting point. Um, uh, as I said, it's really the substance, uh, that the substance of each ground that needs to be communicated. It would be, I think, th it, this is a, like another overriding uh, fairness type issue, but it would be unfair if a party took part in an arbitration yet kept an objection um, up his or her sleeve and only attempted to deploy it later. That's not what wants to, what um, the, the courts want to encourage in these types of matters. Um, and it's not enough that the party mention an issue. The issue must be properly brought to the arbitral tribunal as denying jurisdiction. And so um, the this was at first instance, Mr. Justice Butcher went through these principles so that this case was actually close to the borderline, which is why it would have been interesting to see what the Court of Appeal made made of it but that um, NIOC had done just enough to communicate the substance of its ground of objection for this to now be ventilated fully under Section 67 uh, before the court. And just to kind of, just to recap, because um, I'd appreciate that it's, it's, it's kind of easy to get lost in the weeds and lose the thread of the actual case. What this meant was that National Iranian Oil Company could bring their their jurisdiction challenge they could they could argue it the way they wanted to um it doesn't mean that they that they would succeed on it and and in fact they did not succeed on it but it meant that they were entitled to raise the argument um and it, it then further meant um it, when it when it came to the court of appeal decision the fact that the high court had said there's there's no appealing there's no appealing our decision that the national uh iranian oil company is entitled to to raise these arguments, even though we find that the National Iranian Oil Company's arguments are wrong. Um, the the High Court was then unable to say um, that the, the, the High Court was then unable even to hear that point on appeal. They, the, the 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 Court of Appeal, sorry, the Court of Appeal was then unable to hear that point on appeal because the Court of Appeal was was basically stuck with the High Court's decision unless the High Court uh, gave leave to appeal it. So, should we come on to the the meat of it? Yeah, after thirty minutes of talking, <laughs> <laughs> I do think that's quite an interesting point there because it is the first time that it is. Come it on, is, it's, it a, is. it's a it's a good point of principle, but it doesn't it doesn't get us to the interesting points around how should you lawyer listening to this podcast with a English jurisdiction foreign law case going. How should you be presenting your foreign law evidence? And I, I suppose, in a in a word, the Court of Appeal quite emphatically says that the answer to that question is narrowly. Yes, it is. It is narrowly, and it's it's also. I, I think it, it's not just that. It is that, but it's not just that. There's something a bit broader to make here, broader or narrowly. But th th there's a there's a more um, kind of cutting point, I think, to this, and I've seen this come up in cases where you you'll have a, a case that's let's say in in England, plan an arbitration or what have you, with foreign law governing the underlying contract. So its its jurisdiction is being handled by English solicitors, but uh, there needs to be some foreign law input from another another jurisdiction on the governing law of the contract. And um, you go to a, a foreign law expert and ask them, well, you know, we're, we're trying to construe this contract and this particular type of clause. What would the foreign law say about it? Um, 
and you get this nice glossy report from from the foreign legal expert expert saying, um, yeah, no, I, I, look, if this was being decided under foreign law X, we'd win, no doubt about it. Let me write up a report to that effect, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Um, that's not what the foreign legal expert should be doing, as tempting as it might be, and. The, the fundamental reason for that is that is the court's role, or that is the arbitration panel's role. Like, and and if, you, if you're handing that over to the foreign legal expert, what you end up with is a scenario where the, the legal expert is effectively telling the court how it should rule. And that's not the role of the foreign legal expert. The foreign legal expert is effectively only supposed to comment on the differences um, in uh, legal principle as to how that question may be assessed in the foreign um, foreign country. Uh, and, and not just differences, but explain how what, what legal principles would be applied in that um, foreign country in the construction of the contract. Not what the answer would be, not what the outcome of that analysis would be, but what are the principles that the English court should use and there's some there's some really useful um, points of difference in this case in looking at arbitration agreements to make that point. But that's I think overarching what the um, w what the court's saying here. I have complete sympathy here for um, the the NIOC and and their lawyers because first off that's that's pretty much the way that you would ask the question to the to your expert to begin with. When, when you're talking to your experts about uh, this foreign law issue, the question you're really interested in knowing is what would the, you know, in this situation, what would the Iranian court say about this, about this, uh, this arbitration clause? What would, the, what would the Iranian court say about jurisdiction here? And then invariably you, you get back something that tells you what the Iranian courts would say. You want to, your, your, your human nature almost dictates that you're trying to tell, um, that you're trying to tell the, um, the court or you want the court to hear how how right you are on your case and how and how a lawyer from Iran is you know a very preeminent lawyer from Iran in this case is right behind you on your case and they're saying this you know x y or z but this judgment really emphasized to me at least that the court just doesn't want to hear that that the court wants to the court wants to know what is what are the principles of Iranian law that are in play here they don't want to know what would an Iranian court say about this decision because because that's not really relevant. What's relevant is what would an English court, armed with the knowledge of Iranian law, say about this decision? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, that's that's kind of where the the Court of Appeal starts on this. They set out um, first what are the fundamental errors that NIOC say that the judge made, um, and the, and the way that um, he, he dealt dealt with the legal expert's um, opinion in the wrong way, and there's a, there's a few points there. But then, in terms of analysis, the starting point here is, what's the position under English law? And um, there's no doubt, I think, that, as the court says here, that if this question um, was to be construed under English law, uh, that the arbitration agreement in this contract would confer jurisdiction on the arbitrators to determine that B to C liability that we've talked about between Crescent and CNGC. Um, and that's, um, we've got Mustel and Boyd on commercial arbitration here recited. And I think this is, this is a neat little um, uh, reminder for, for those uh, that, that like this topic. Uh, the position is, we suggest, similar to that, which does from time to time arise in practice, where in order to resolve a dispute between A and B, an arbitrator has to decide an issue arising under a contract between B and C. There is nothing inarbitral about such an issue, and the arbitrator commits no impropriety by deciding it, although his award will have no effect at all on C, and it goes on. Um, but this is the point that we opened with earlier, Callum, um, yeah. that under English law, this would be quite a, a straightforward question, um, and... You know, there's then authority here, the decision of Mr. Justice Andrew Smith in the Arsenovia 20, 20, uh, 2012 decision to the same effect um, and some other points as well. Um, 
And then from there, the court assesses the Iranian legal expert's report to see how, if it does, um, uh, explain what are the differences under Iranian law when construing an arbitration agreement. What is the contractual interpre interpretation? What is the approach? What are the canons of construction? Are they different to the way that English law would, would, would look at this? And if so, let's lay them out. Is it a more literal approach? Is it more purposive? Is it more, you know, does it um, take other factors into account? Does there have to be ambiguity first? Like, you know, those are the kinds of, we talk about these um, principles on, of contract in, uh, interpretation regularly on the podcast. You will have heard us mention these over and over again. Indeed, I think our last podcast, we had a whole section on it. What the court's saying here is they want to hear from the foreign legal expert how are those canons of construction different in Iran? How should we be looking at it differently? Not what the answer is, but how do we look at it? There were some differences. There, there, were, there, there were differences between um, uh, Iranian law and English law on, on the scope of arbitration, um, uh, the, the scope of arbitration agreements, um, on the way that arbitration agreements would, would be read. It, it, it came through from the, or at least in the judgment, you can tell that it came through from from the expert reports um, provided by uh, the National Iranian Oil Company that there were these differences of of points of law. Um, it's it's just that the it seemed as though the expert report also included a lot of additional comment around what an Iranian court would then go on to say about this particular case, and that's where you and that's where you kind of fall off the fall off the wagon as far as English courts are concerned and you start talking about something which is in inadmissible and irrelevant. Yeah, exactly. I think it's it's summed up here um, in the King and Brandy wine reinsurance case um, where the court said, where the applicable law of the contract is foreign law, questions of interpretation are governed by the applicable law. In such a case, the role of the expert is not to give evidence as to what the contract means. The role is to, is to prove the rules of construction of the foreign law. It is then for the court to interpret the contract in accordance with those rules. Quite a neat, neat, neat principle there. And, and I really emphasize this for anyone who's got a case where they're introducing foreign law. I think the starting point is what is the role of the foreign legal expert? What is their report supposed to be doing? What questions do we put to that legal expert to ensure that the report comes across in the right way? And, you know, th this is not an easy um, task to do, as we know, Callum. You know, we, when you're dealing with foreign legal experts in jurisdictions all over the world, they will be used to writing briefs. They might be used to writing academic papers. Um, they'll know their law inside and out. Um, and so there are different approaches to this all over the world. And so there is a real role here in um, explaining to the the foreign legal expert, well, what are, what are you what are we trying to achieve here? What can we achieve? What will the court want to see? And I highly recommend that anyone who's dealing with um, this area comes and has a look at this judgment and the relevant sections because it's it's quite instructive. Those are re really I'm um, uh, it's conscious that we're we are as ever we've we're 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 going well on on distance, but. Um, the, the those are really the key points. Stamina, stamina has never been our problem. Yeah. No, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> On this podcast, <laughs> but but I think that you know that those are the key points from this case. And you know then then with that all said, the um, the court then goes on to look at what the Iranian law position actually were actually was. Um, you know they they then go on to say, well, actually looking at it fairly. The High Court did not make any error in the way that it went about this um, the, its, its summary application of, or its summary um, uh, dismissal of the Section sixty seven appeal. Um, there, there was there was no prospect of success on the basis of Iranian law as presented to us by the National Iranian Oil Company anyway, and so the appeal failed. But r really, the, the the key the key point of kind of continued application for those who who won't routinely be um, using Iranian arbitration law in their disputes was that it was 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 these points that you mentioned, Luke, around how to present your foreign law expert uh, evidence. Yeah, and just on on the Iranian law um, 
on arbitration agreements and, and how to construe them here. I think ultimately why NIOC lost on this point, and there's a few points in here, but the, the matter of substance and where I think ultimately whilst there were some differences and Iranian law has a more restrictive approach to interpreting the scope of an arbitration agreement than England. That seemed clear. Um, but there were still some principles for construing that which were not that different to English law. And I think th th there's this paragraph here where um, the Iranian law expert um, uh, mentioned that an arbitration agreement, like any other contract, is only subject to interpretation under the relevant principles of the applicable law where there is an ambiguity in the text of the agreement. If there is no ambiguity, the text is strictly interpreted. Yeah. Now, I don't know when you read that, but I know when I read that, I'm like, oh, well, I've, I've heard something pretty similar to that before Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, in English law. And I think that's where the court ultimately said, well, yes, there are there, there's there can be a restrictive approach and there can be a broader approach. There can be, you know, the Fiona Trust almost assumption of breadth into an arbitration agreement as all-encompassing and bringing everything in, um, perhaps that's one end of the spectrum. And then the other end of the spectrum is a restrictive approach where you're, you're looking at the clause more literally and, and having, you know, a, a sharper pencil in, in drawing the line of uh, uh, between in and out. Um, but even still, you still need to construe the words of the clause and even if you take a literal, you know, restrictive approach to the language in this clause, there was enough breadth in it to pull in um, this dispute. And, and, and that was really, I think, the long and short of it. And I uh, like to see so many times if, where once you have a contract which is clear, then the contract is clear. And all the, all the different contractual interpretation provisions, you know, uh, that you can dream of will tend to fall away in the face of clear drafting. Yeah, and it was interesting because, uh, you know, we don't have the full report here. We've got relevant sections cited. Um, the, you know, there was this, I think I, I, I'm right in this career if I'm wrong, but there was a, a, a statement by the expert that um, it was, there was actually no ambiguity in the other direction, um, that uh, that the claim would not be, um, uh, would not fall within the arbitration agreement under under Iranian law and, it, I thought that that was a, a, a difficult um, point for uh, for the NIOC, uh, and, and if and if the legal principles under Iranian law were more that okay, in the event of ambiguity, you then look at some other part of the agreement, or you get steered in a different direction, and if you look at those other areas, then you you end up at this conclusion where the claim doesn't fall within the arbitration agreement for X, Y, Z reason. That would have been um, that I, I I could see that getting a bit more traction than well if you read this literally that then it it clearly falls outside. I think that 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 that's almost that again that strays more towards the legal conclusion under Iranian law and what an Iranian court would do rather than focusing on the the legal principle around construction. Totally agree. Do you think? So do you think this is one that we see again? Do you think this one goes all the way to the Supreme Court? I don't think so. You know, famous last words and all that. But I, I suspect this is the end of it. There are big numbers involved, though. Yeah. Um, there's the indemnity claim floating around. Uh, you know, uh, who knows? We, we may yeah. pop up again in certain... I'll never say never in terms of seeing the the party's names again um, in a case, but I'm not sure this particular decision will be appealed further. I, I also thought just, you know, as a rounding off and probably should have said it earlier, it, I did note early on that um, the parties actually agreed on the seat in both instances. They agreed on London and they agreed on Geneva for uh, for a second arbitration that was brought as well. So, um, yeah, interesting. Um, that's how we ended up with a decision of the English Court of Appeal, ultimately. Yeah, very interesting. My, I, I think this one probably only would have gone up on the on the on that question of whether or not the Court of Appeal can give permission to appeal from a section, from a decision on uh, section 73, that's probably the niche legal point that we'd, that we'd get um, pulses racing uh, in the Supreme yeah. Court. Um, yeah, they, they didn't, they didn't need it ultimately, but I agree. I, th yeah. I, th I think you're right. Um, that would have been a tough, a tough position. Um, yeah.
uh, I would really like to see that fully written out and uh, and um, you know if that if that survived. But anyway, yeah, that's for another day. All right, yeah. thank you for listening in, everyone. Um, this has been a bit of a, a marathon, um, but it's a really uh, detailed judgment. I think it deserved the attention that we've given it today. Um, uh, a lot on the line, a lot of takeaways for for those practicing in in the arbitration space. Um, and yeah, as always, Cal, I, I really enjoyed this one. Uh, I really did too. Really, I, I really enjoyed sitting down and reading it, reading some of um, Lord Justice Mail's. Uh, it's been a while since we had a Lord Justice Mail's, Mail's decision, and they are always just extremely readable. You know, I don't, I don't know. But I always battle with whether or not I can say these kind of things about Lord Justice's work. Obviously, it's readable. Obviously, it's, it's extremely uh, lucid and well thought, thought through. But they just they really cut through these kind of commercial legal issues that we see so regularly in a way that um, makes it yeah, quite enjoyable to read. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I know we, 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 we should have some kind of disclaimer on everything that we say that we, it's with respect. Exactly. Of it because... Uh, because uh, uh, of course it is, um, uh, but I enjoy it. I enjoy it too. And you know, when sometimes the, the, there's a decision we might not agree with, and you know, that's part part of what we're commentating on. Um, but this isn't one of them. No. Uh, until next time, take care, everyone. Cheers, everybody. Bye.